Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to our second webinar on hydromorphology. Thank you for taking the time out of your day today to join us, and we hope you'll enjoy it. Please note that the questions and answers function is still available on our screen. <clears throat> so you just submit your question and hopefully if time allows, we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Rasa O'Brien, who's a research officer here with us in IFI. Okay, false or off, welcome to the webinar. And today I'm going to talk about hydromorphology, why it's important for river habitats, and how it can inform climate mitigation in our rivers. Okay, so the presentation will be broken up into three parts. The first part will cover hydromorphology, what is it? The second part, um, how it's important to habitat, and the third part, um, how we can relate it to climate change mitigation. So the term hydromorphology comes from the Water Framework Directive. And under the Water Framework Directive, um, we need to bring our water bodies up to at least good status, or good ecological status. And hydromorphology is one of the important elements used to assess that. So <clears throat> hydromorphology is um, defined as the study of river processes and, and the conditions within them. It also considers um, both the human impact and the natural impact on river ecosystems. So maybe um, a better a better term than hydromorphology is hydrogeomorphology, where hydro accounts for hydrology and geomorphology for the, the sediment processes. So together, that's what shapes the river form or the river landscape. And um, in terms of hydromorphology assessments, what we look at is you know, hydrology, surface and subsurface, uh, channel morphology, substrate material, riverbanks, riparian vegetation, and floodplain. And um, riparian vegetation is also a biological element, but riparian vegetation has a, a strong influence on sediment and erosion processes, and bank stability, etc., which is why it's included. Okay, so there are three fundamental hydrogeomorphic processes, and they are sediment erosion sediment transport and sediment deposition. So as the water flows downstream, it shapes the river landscape through these processes. On your left here, we have a um, classical or idealized um, sediment transport model. Um, what it does is it divides the catchment up into three zones. So in the upper zone, our headwaters, we have our production zone. In the middle, our transportation zone. And in the bottom, um, our deposition zone. So the headwaters generally are where we have the steep slopes and material is eroded here and carried downstream into the transportation zone and so some of your gravels etc will drop out here and then the finer material is washed further downstream into our deposition zone. And on your right here we see this kind of um, illustrated a bit more and yeah, so in our upper caption with our high gradients we have our steep channels that are down cutting, and that's with large materials such as boulders and cobbles. As we move downstream into our middle section, and um, the river starts to become a bit more sinuous, and we have gravel deposits, gravel bars, and this is where we get our, our typical pool riffle glide sequences. And as we move further downstream, the river starts to meander more, and we get more deposition and finer material. And it's also important to note that. It's like realized that rivers will also uh, erode and recruit material on their bends in the river section, in the middle section of the river. And this makes a quite an important contribution to our bed material. Okay, so at this point, you should also point out that the river is more than just a flowing channel and the three dimensions of the river really. We have our underground hydrology. So that's our underlying aquifer and that's made up of the Periheat aquifer and the hyperheat aquifer. So the hyperheat aquifer is just a transition zone between the surface channel and the subsurface. And the second dimension is our active channel area and the floodplain. So our channel is migrating across this, this valley floor here over time. And during high flows, it might break its flat its banks and connect with the floodplain. And then our third dimension is the riparian zone. So this is the vegetation zone that's adjacent to the river. 
and represents our interface between our terrestrial habitats and our aquatic habitats. Uh, during uh, low flow summer events, for example, you might wonder how we have water in the river, even though we haven't had weeks, we haven't had rain in weeks. So basically, the channel is being fed by water from the subsurface here and from water that's infiltrating over the land. So that water might have fallen in, as rain in the winter and it slowly works its way down into the river. Okay, so in this slide here, we can have a, a closer look at what these hydromorphological processes mean to river habitat and how they affect it. So in our slide here, we're seeing a lowland meander river and with our typical habitats that we associate with salmonids. So in our pool here, this is where the river is eroding on the bend. And it creates that deep area for adult fish such as uh, large trout or salmon. That material is then carried downstream and where it deposits, it creates a uh, riffle. And of course, that's where our adult fish spawn. And then our fry emerge here and they hang around there for a year or so, or they move on to the run, which is kind of transition zone between riffle and pool. So the key point here is that those hydromorphic processes of erosion and deposition are key to creating habitat and maintaining it over the longer term. Okay, but this isn't always the case because a lot of our rivers in Ireland now, the hydromorphological processes have been disrupted or modified. So in our map here on the left, um, these are all attachments where hydromorphology is a significant or the most significant pressure affecting ecological status. Um, some of them will also have you know, pressures from water quality, etc. We tend to have multiple stress in the attachment. Now, hydromorphology is the second most prevalent pressure in Irish catchments you know, after, um, after water quality, which is arguably degraded due to organic pollution. Okay, so when we go out to uh, assess hydromorphological status, we generally use metrics. We focus on a number of components in the river and, set, and give it a score based on how natural or how modified the river is. On your left here, we have a very natural river. Um, and the reason this is high status is because the riparian zone is intact. The natural channel form you see here with the features we expect that indicates natural erosion and deposition. And the river is free to connect with floodplain. In our highly modified river, no riparian zone, the river has been straightened, banks have been riprapped, which prevents the river eroding and migrating, and we have no connection to the floodplain either because we have these flood walls. This is all presumably because people, basically there's houses built in the floodplain here. Okay, so for me, these um, other people working in rivers, these are typical kind of hydromorphological modifications you see in Irish rivers. And on the left here, I think it's the field, and we have a drain in North Kerry. And when we get any type of rain, all that fine sediment here and that land drain, that washes down into the river smother anything on the bed of the river, but it also clogs the bed of the river. And if you remember earlier, I talked about some surface flows maintaining low summer flows. Well, they enter into the gravel in the bed of the river, and if the bed of the river is blocked, it will impair that function. So we can end up with higher temperatures as well. And in picture two here, we have an arterial drained river and associated maintenance program. So this is done to maintain land drainage and water conveyance. Fortunately, we end up with a very homogenous habitat. And another um, impact from that is the river is, is very open and exposed. Wider channel heats up quicker and no tree cover here, so we end up with high summer temperatures. On the right here, we have a flood relief scheme in the lower Dargo. And this happened because apartments were built in the floodplain, and not surprisingly, they flooded. So we followed up with a very extensive flood relief scheme and as you can guess, this doesn't really make for very good habitat, and it also suffers from uh, similar temperature pressures as we had in picture two here. And in picture four here, we have a you know, weir on the River Dodder. These type of large weirs basically have a ponding effect. They create mini lakes behind them, cheap up in the summer. And as that water flows downstream, you end up with uh, very warm downstream temperatures, which aren't suitable for cold water species. 
And in picture five here, we have Golden Falls on the Liffey. And this does pretty much the same thing as picture four, but just on a much grander scale. Okay, so before I talk further about um, temperature regimes, I just want to draw your attention to some um, thresholds here. So these are temperature thresholds for brown trout. I'll be referring to these later, so you'll see them plot on, on the later graphs. So 16 is probably the upper optimal limit for, for brown trout to perform best below these temperatures. Once you get above that, you're into suboptimal habitat. 19.7, that's or 19.4, that's a sub lethal temperature. So brown trout will stop feeding and growing. They just hang around and the water becomes cooler. We have extended periods of that, it's really bad for their fitness. And then at 24.7 here, that's the black line, that's the lethal temperature for trout. So really a couple, couple of days a week um, is all they can take, otherwise they're going to die. Okay, so here we have an example of two rivers, and one with high cover, one with low, and one with high tree cover, and one with low tree cover in North Dublin. It's the Broad Meadow and it's Sister River to Ward. On the graph here, um, we have temperature data plotted from 2013 when the summer was pretty warm, and it's from two stations just above where the rivers join. Broken black line here at the bottom is the Ward River with its relatively high tree cover, and we can see that generally throughout the summer it stays below the sub lethal temperature and generally hospitable for brown trout. Whereas in contrast, our Ward River here with its low tree cover. It's pretty inhospitable, and uh, we've lethal, some lethal temperatures for much of the summer, and even a period there where we have lethal temperatures. And we can take the tree course an important element in the landscape in terms of moderation temperature. So, building on that study, we did some other studies um, with colleagues in IFI, and these focused on seven rivers here on the east coast. And we had a range of rivers of very good hydromorphological condition, for example, one here in the top, ones with moderate condition in the middle, ones with bad to poor condition at the bottom. All of these rivers have salmonids in them. And in summary, what we found was that our hydromorphology is good, temperatures are cool, and our fish community is dominated by salmonids. As we had hydromorphological pressures, Increased, we found we have a mixed community with a mix of salmonids, and species are more temperature tolerant yeah. because the temperature is going up. Then, in our rivers that are very modified, they have the highest temperatures, and salmon and trout tended to be absent, and the fish community was dominated by species such as stone oak and minnow. Well, another pressure we find on our rivers in terms of hydromorphology is river regulation. That's associated with dams and reservoirs. Here we have results of 2021. On the left here, we have free flowing rivers. And uh, the Owen Door, the Slane, and the Dargat all draining uh, Dublin Wicklow Mountains. And on the right here, we have the, the Liffey, the Bartree, and the Dodder draining the same mountains. And what we find is that the regulated rivers are much warmer. And um, not only that, um, the temperatures don't drop back at night. So an example here is where we had sublethal temperatures on the same in a very warm period in July, but we see that the at night the temperature drops back below the sublethal threshold. Whereas on the Liffey here, which is the other red line, they stay above it. And in general, on the Bartry, which is the green line and the Liffey, they stay above the optimal temperature for trout throughout the whole summer. So it's really so optimal habitat. And the river dollar is the blue one here at the bottom. That actually had a much more uh, natural temperature regime. And that's why we'll talk about it later. Okay, so similar to reservoirs, uh, dams have a similar impact. So here I have some data and slides from my colleagues in the National Virus Program. And uh, this is we're on the Blackwater Kells and Mead. And there was a logger upstream and a logger downstream in 2018 when we fight a warm summer. And that data is plotted on the graph here over 30 day period in June, July. 
what we see for the blue line, which is upstream, is that the temperatures regularly are above the sub lethal for the crowd during the day. It drops back at night, whereas our downstream temperatures, I might count with a full 18 days of temperatures above the sub lethal threshold. It's really not very good. Of course, there's a lot of research going on, or, on around weirs and buyers and rivers are present. And one study here in Canada recently published has shown that uh, large weirs result in 16 to 23 day delay for salmon migrating upstream. And that this results in, in fat loss, which of course affects our fitness and spawning ability. But the really kind of key finding here was that although the delay contributes to fat loss, the actual uh, biggest driver of fat loss is thermal stress. So really something we need to think about in terms of the impact of dams or, or weirs or culverts or whatever they might be as we look into the future. Okay, so now I'm only coming to climate change now because everything that I spoke about before this, that's already existing in the landscape. So climate change is now imposed on top of that. So we already have temperature and flow pressures, now we've climate change um, imposed on top of that. Um, and the projections are from 2070 to the end of the century, we have temperature increases of about two and a half to three degrees for Ireland. Um, that's on the average temperature, so you've got to think in the future, summers of into their 30s and even into their into 40 degrees will be a more common feature. We'll also have uh, more droughts. And in winter, we're expected to have uh, more flooding. Uh, which is basically called it more range. So all of that is going to exacerbate the stresses we already have in our rivers. So what can we do about it and how can we manage it? Because hydromorphology can inform some of that. So earlier on, we established that riparian zones um, are a really good tool in terms of moderating high summer temperatures. So that really will need to be our first port of call. Here we have an example uh, of, of that's a broad meadow again in, in an agricultural landscape and we have low levels of tree cover. We have the Delvin River up the road from it and it's also in a similar landscape but it has quite an impact for riparian zone. Temperatures in this in the Delvin River were much lower. It was also reflected in the fish community where this was completely dominated by um, salmonid species. Whereas in the broad meadow we found a lot of minnow and sonoids. So we really, really need to be looking at, you know, buffer zones of five to 10 meters here. You know, single line is not enough. That's not an intact riparian zone. If you get an intact riparian zone with three key functions, moderate stream temperatures. They also intercept nutrients that wash off the land and take it up in the roots. This will be really important as we go into the future if you think about us having more rain and more runoff into the rivers. So we need to capture that pollution before it gets there. The other thing about riparian zones is they're also important habitats in their own right and they contribute material to the river in the form of leaves and wood and falling insects, which is really important to aquatic food webs. Okay, and one of the other measures we can undertake is in-stream works. At the moment, IFI are engaged in um, these type of in-stream uh, works on the left here. So on the top left here, you see we've Weir and that's resulted in, in a drop pool below it. And um, we've added gravel here to create a uh, spawning area. So similar here in the bottom left. Uh, the drawback with these type of uh, works is that they're not self sustaining, which means that we have to go back every amount of years and fix, to make sure maintaining their function. Sometimes this is all we can do because we're operating in a very constrained environment. But at the same time, a key aim of conservation biology is to create self-sustaining systems. And by that I mean um, self-sustaining systems are ecosystems that replicate their habitats. And by doing that, we have a transfer of energy between living organisms and non -living, uh, the non-living environment and back again from the non-living to the living organisms. So in the right, top right here, we have a stretch on the River Dargle, nice riparian zone here. This tree has fallen in across the river, and by doing that, it has obstructed um, gravel from moving downstream. That has created a, a ripple feature for fish to spawn in. 
has created a plunge, uh, plunge pool below it. So we have natural habitat as part of natural processes. Um, in the bottom right here, we have something similar. This is a trail of the River Dee in Loud. It was arterial drained in the 60s. And for some reason, they didn't go back to it for a long time. The development of a riparian zone and wood falling into the river. And we get our river pool feature here. And in the winter, this will pond out and we'll have our, our spawning side here upstream. But in the summer, it also creates a shaded refuge. So fish can go into this pool and hide out when it's warm. Okay, so what I'm trying to say there now is that wood is good and it creates habitat, it's a driver of habitat. So on the left here, we have the Ong Gareth River in Kerry, and we wood falling into the river. It's great, our riffle here and our pool here. On the top right here, we have the River Liffey and a tree has fallen in. Those submerged branches create or like a kind of reef underneath the water. Juvenile fish can see cover there from predators, etc. In the bottom left here, we have a graph. This is a review of 211 studies and emphasized large wood addition into river as part of restoration works. Trend trail increased by about 50% on average in these restoration projects. But Atlantic salmon was the big winner where we're rebounding up to 250% increase. So really, you know, say wood is good. Okay, now on to something a bit grander and bigger in terms of our thinking. Uh, here we have a river out in, in, on the west, Harb in the west. Uh, so we have a number of very important catchments that we need to manage into the future. <coughs> and we pressures obviously with climate change and everything else. Uh, this river in terms of its uh, erosion and deposition processes is really good. It's a really a natural dead form and uh, straight material. It's also got no riparian zone, and um, this is reflected in the water temperature recorded there last summer. And uh, on the plot here, we have two lines of yellow and blue line. The blue is from the pool, and the yellow is from the green. And you can see that it's regularly above the sub lethal temperatures there. And one surprising finding is that the pool is actually warmer than the, than the glide. So the implication there is if you're going to have pools as refuges during low flows or high temperature events need to be shaded. On our right here, we have an example in a similar river setting to, to our Irish River here on the left. This is in Scotland where the valley has been restored. So they basically undertake restoration of native woodland and peatland conservation. Um, and that's kind of what we'd be looking for up here on the left. We have ambitious plans for this. And they're probably the kind of ambitious and big measures we need to take on and going into the future, we want to keep salmon in our rivers. Now back to our, our regulated rivers. So I spoke earlier about the water and why that was cooler. Well, one the management concept for regulated rivers is environmental flows. So environmental flows are the quantity, time, and type of water flow release needed to maintain your ecological processes. In the picture here on the top right, that's the daughter, and that receives water off the top of the reservoir, but also off the bottom of the reservoir. So water coming out of the bottom is a lot cooler, so we get mixing there. That's why when we looked at our graph here, why the daughter is so much cooler. But when you look at the Liffey, all the water is coming off the top of the reservoir, and that's why it's so warm. It just heats up in the summer, and then it's released. So we need to look into incorporating this type of management and other measures um, into the regulated system so that we have what we call environmental flows. And on to our barriers, finally. Um, IFI are already engaged in barrier mitigation, so this would be a typical type of thing. Uh, we have a rock ramp here on the left, and it's credit to our staff. This takes, you know, a lot of investigation and a lot of skills and expertise within these structures. Uh, but one drawback of them is they don't deal with the upstream ponding. And as we saw earlier, um, high temperatures are um, an increasing pressure in our river systems. Um, in B here in the bottom left with the white glass channel, which is one option. So you will have improved flow there and not as much ponding behind it. Uh, but you still end up with kind of dead zones downstream, for example, what we see here. Fish could swim into them and wouldn't really be good. 
on the right here, we have a river where it was breached. So the reservoir, or sorry, the, the weir is gone, and this is the best case scenario. Uh, your hydromorphology is natural in terms of rivers reconnected, in terms of flow and sediment transport, which are able to spin up and downstream. And it also results in, in a more natural temperature regime. Okay, so just to summarize, and uh, this is a take home message. Hydromorphology deals with flow, channel morphology, and riparian zone. These are really important uh, components of our habitat. We want to manage for climate change, this is where we need to be looking. Riparian tree cover is really effective at moderating extreme temperatures. So that should be our first port, port of call. In terms of driving habitat and natural processes, uh, wood is a really key component in that. We've taken a lot of it out of our rivers. Uh, over the centuries, we can start adding a bit back in where, where it's possible. And for our, our more important catchments, um, we need to get out beyond the river and look at our landscape approach. So really, we're talking space and rivers, so the rivers can behave um, naturally. Once they can do that, the river knows what to do, and it will maintain the best conditions for in-stream biota. Environmental flows are a potential mitigation tool for systems such as uh, Liffey or the Daughter or the League, where we're replicating elements of the natural flow regime. Physical barriers, they have a big thermal impact. So we really need to kind of maybe rethink uh, some of the means we use to address them. And then finally, we want to have self sustaining systems, we need to have natural processes, and hydromorphology is part of that. Okay, so I just wanted to thank uh, my colleagues, etc., that worked with me on uh, that research over the years. Couldn't have done it without you. And uh, right, Shine, you're marvelous, and um, I'll take a few questions. Thanks, Rasta. Okay, the first question in here is: Do you think um, during the artificial creation of pools, riffles, are there sediment issues to deal with? Is this during the construction site? I presume they mean during the construction stage. So anytime we get into the river and we do works, you know, we're moving sediment around in the river. So it is going to create, um, you know, some sediment issues. Some of that's going to be dislodged. And so I guess we can say that there might be kind of a short-term impact. I mean, the longer term, it's creating habitat. And so you have to balance it against that. Okay. Um, do you think the results from these surveys and research will inform the planning requirements going forward to include riparian habitat um, me methods to be done? Yeah, I certainly hope so. That's why we're doing this. And um, so really we want our, our planning policy to be based on the best science. Um, that's why we're um, doing this type of work. And, you know, we have a body of literature and peer review literature to support that now. Okay. Um, is there a flood risk associated with the presence of large wooden rivers? Okay, so anytime you put a, or there's an object in the river, obviously it's creating an obstruction. And so if we're going to have wood in rivers, we need to have a policy around its management. Sometimes it might be just a matter of just reorient, or reorient, reorientating the wood and to allow the river to, to flow. And um, the other thing is if we're Integrating it into restoration schemes, what you'll see in North America and in Scotland and places is what they have is engineered log jams. So structures are engineered where they're fixed into the river and they're normally stress tested to withstand you know, a thousand year flood. So that's one way of thinking about it. And finally, the wood in rivers, it can create you know, possibly local flooding. If you have a lot of wood in the river, it's actually slowing the flow. So it's in, if it's in the upper catchment, Storing the water up there before it goes down into the main catch where it can actually cause flooding. Okay. Another question was how do we prioritize hydromorphology issues on rivers um, in order to prioritize our work and funding, etc.? Okay, so I guess that has to be part of the uh, the assessment process. And um, so what's happening now between ourselves and between the EPA and other water water, uh, water agencies? is that our rivers are being assessed uh, under the Water Framework Directive. And as you can see from the map I showed there earlier, um, hydromorphology is significant pressure. So if we use that as basically our basis, 
we build up a database of water bodies and what the pressures are. Then when we do do our, our restoration work, we know we should be addressing hydromorphology or possibly maybe some other water pressure, such as water quality or maybe we bow pressures in the, in the catchment, and that's what we need to focus on. Okay, the distance downstream, the thermal influence of reservoirs extends before the heating effect dissipates. Okay, so that's a really good question. And um, we're, we're just starting to look at that now. Um, and I, we, I don't have an answer, um, but we are currently looking at it and um, we have quite a lot of data on reservoirs now and we'll be starting to process some of that soon enough. We'll start to look at uh, basically that distance effect and to see where it stops and what we can do to mitigate it. Okay, another question was, how do we facilitate restoration of rivers along populated areas? It would be great to see more natural rivers in towns and villages. Okay, so in those type of rivers, we're obviously working uh, subject to a lot of constraints because we have people living in and beside the rivers and really can't be flooding in those areas. So in terms of in-stream works and stuff like that, they're going to tend to be fixed uh, features. Some of the stuff I showed there earlier and uh, really will be a maintenance program that will have to go with that. Even where we have a narrow strip beside the river, and that's where we can look at, you know, basically enhan enhancing the vegetation. It might develop even a single tree line there. Okay. Um, I'll just take one more, and there's a lot I'm going to miss out on, but um, I'm trying to combine them. Um, can the climate projections with respect to increased frequency and, and intensities of low flows be significantly mitigated with riparian zones? Okay, so I feel part of that question. I would say maybe put some of that question to the colleagues in, in the climate change program. We've got a really excellent uh, presentation the other week from John Coyne. What I will say is that what we've been seeing in terms of where we have heavy shading, uh, I showed an example there from the Broad Meadow and the Water Rivers, two sister rivers. In the river with heavy shading, and it was up to seven degrees cooler. So that, that's a very significant amount. And so that's obviously only in kind of rivers that are, you know, seven, eight, ten meters wide. It, it changes in bigger rivers, but at least in those channels which make up the bulk of our network, it's possible. So we're projecting to have temperature increases by about two to three degrees. But we can, uh, you know, mitigate up to seven degrees, and certainly we can mitigate some of it. Okay. And then this is just an interesting one. Um, has any work been done on artificial shading of stream pools? Are you aware of it? No. I'm not. I don't really have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard of that either. And then just the last one was, um, should we not be weighing all land drainage from agriculture, forestry, roads as elements, as elements in ultimate hydromorphology assessments? Yeah, we should. So that's a, a landscape approach, and really that's the space we need to get into where we're, we're bringing everything in. So what's going on in the landscape is affecting the rivers. Rivers are obviously in the bottom of the valley, so subject to everything. Whatever's flowing downstream or flowing across the slopes in the valley is going to affect the rivers. Yeah, I, I agree that's the space we need to get into. Okay. Okay, we leave it at that then. Um, thank you, everybody, and thanks, Rasa. Thank you.